Okay, so last week we went through question 20, and it was talking about, uh, we had a large discussion around, is everyone saved, or is just a select, or a some division or category saved, and there is not. And then we went through all sorts of different uh, verses in Scripture around uh, the differences between the two, uh, why did they exist, and how when you're at a party or you're talking to friends or anybody on the street and they just say, oh, well, I believe everybody gets in, you know, uh, I, my God's so loving and good that there is no person that is excluded from um, his kingdom. And we see time and time again in scripture and in the verses that we went over last week that that is uh, not the case. That you can turn away from God that he does divide people, and the, the bar is essentially belief and faith in Christ Jesus, in God, and no other way can get you to him. And so that's what 20 was answering. No, only those by the true faith as uh, he engrafted into him and receive all his benefits. And so, <coughs> pardon me, we listed out, or I had you list out, people to pray for, people to think about um, in your own life uh, who may have, who uh, maybe see it, as I said, where they think everybody's going to get in or they don't believe at all. You know, who could we be praying for, you know, um, either in church or in our prayer groups or at home uh, in our morning or our evening devotionals, whenever we are thinking about it. And so sometimes listing down who to pray for helps out, helps bring back to your memory where, and you could be like, well, I don't need to list them out. I pray for the same five people all the time, and that might be the case. So, <laughs> and then I had you for a personal reflection, uh, true faith, which is the subject of the next question. I told you you could cheat if you wanted to, but I really wanted to hear what you guys thought. Uh, what do you think that means? What does true faith mean to you? Faith in God alone? Receive it. Receive it? Okay. So f true faith is, so far we got, hold on, let's see here. True faith. Knowing God's word. So we, so we know, we receive. Those are some action words, but then also on the other side we had that uh, it's in God. Any other things that maybe popped up when you were thinking about it? Or just now as you were thinking about it? Uh, not in my control. Not in your control, outside your control. I mean, yeah. Relationship with God. Relationship, I like that one. Every day. Every day, that's right. So true faith, we, we, we see no, we see receive. Uh, it's outside your control. So the actions, the, the will, the things that are going on, um, our relationship with him, and it's every day. Uh, it's not a, a fair weather fan, so to speak. Somebody who's you know, like, oh, I have faith in God today because he's blessed me. And tomorrow I'll curse him because he hasn't. <laughs> it's something that is every day. Um, any other thoughts? No? Assurance. 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 Yeah. Assurance. Oh, yeah. To know that when things are going wrong or not in the way you thought they'd go, to have faith mm -hmm. that this is what God wants. This is where he is leading you. Or if the devil is testing you, that he will see you through. So there's that assurance there. I like that. Good. <clears throat> Well, those are some great words. Did you all, did you all look ahead? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't, you're like, I didn't even open up the binder. <laughs> okay. So question 21, all is surrounding what is true faith. And, you know, this is a big question, especially for uh, new people in belief or in faith. You know, what does that mean, like, to have faith in God? What does it mean to, to, to trust in him? 
And what, what does a true faith look like versus, a, I guess, a false faith or an incomplete faith or a, a lacking faith? We know there's been, there was no uh, shortage of times where uh, Jesus rebuked people for not having enough faith in, and, he, and it wasn't that he was requesting all the faith in the world, just a small amount of faith to have faith in God, uh, because then amazing and wondrous things were possible. Okay. Well, so, uh, so that's what you at home can see. I'm moving to question 21 now. And that's page, oh, that's a bad P. It's 42. Is that the sun? Is that what I heard? <laughs> oh, goodness. Maybe it'll melt some of this. Okay. So let's start off by uh, reading. And again, we have a lot of verses on 21. That's why we've broken it. It continues onto the second page. Um, but we're going to go through and... Uh, let's see what we can see about what is true faith. Can somebody read the first verse for me? But let, us, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Right. And so, like Phil said, with assurance and every day, a consistency there, just the idea that while you may doubt yourself, you don't doubt God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Because you know that you are imperfect and you're sinful and you stumble and you fall. And so you, we constantly battle with anxieties of our own performance, our own servanthood, but not in God. So no doubting. And then it goes on to say, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind, which should immediately point you or bring about... Uh, the image or the, or the reading of Peter with the wind and the waves, and he's out there and he's trusting in the Lord, but as soon as he takes his eyes off, as soon as he starts to doubt, he begins to sink. And then he becomes like the wave of the sea. <laughs> um, yes. And let's see here. Can someone read Romans 4, 8 for me? All right. What is it trying to say here? God has forgiven our sins. God is forgiving. We trust in him. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's the idea. Uh, you might, uh, some people will have like an imposter syndrome. You know, you'll be, they'll be out evangelizing to somebody or talking with somebody, and they know that they're, you know, hypocritical or they've struggled with this in the past. And they, how dare they even utter the words of God because they are sinners. And so blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And so through, uh, through God's mercy and love, he turns, he, I guess, he does not count the sin that you have had because you are in his service. And that's a, that's a blessing. It's a, it's a wonderful blessing. And it should give us all confidence, boldness, courage, to go and whether it's uh, to do a task that God has laid out for you, do a, a work or a call to somewhere, or if it's something as simple as just having a conversation with a person and just knowing that you're a sinner, but God has forgiven and has work for you to do. And what a blessing that is. And let's see here. What would that be? So that'd be sort of under no. So knowing that, uh, receiving that, uh, and then it also, there's a, I guess there again, assurance, and it speaks to the relationship. So I'll come back to this list because I think you guys nailed it. Um, and then so Romans 5.1 now. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace. That's so wonderful. I was at uh, pastor prayer uh, was it last week? Or no, it was this week. Man, I tell you, days sometimes feel like whole weeks. <laughs> it's been seven weeks since the last uh, Sunday. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, somebody, one of the pastors who, uh, you know, we, leads the devotional, you know, we try to, you know, rotate. And 
his thing was he brought up these all these images of different people in different situations. You had a wrestler and a soldier and somebody sitting by a dock and you had a big, big mountain of garbage. You had a, a homeless person. And the question was, what's your ministry or what's your relationship with your ministry look like? What's your relationship with your family look like? And so we all went around and we pointed at pictures and all that. But the question that I really, I probably should have brought up, but it came to me now was like, what is your, what is your relationship with God look like? What's your, what's your heart look like? And then to have that inside, even though outside might be a giant mountain of garbage or, you know, some Goliath standing in front of you. Do you have that peace, that inside, in your heart peace in that relationship with the Lord? So that way, no matter what is thrown at you, you can always return to that comfort. And so because we are justified by this faith that we, we, we know we have received, we know it, we, we've received it. We understand that God is more powerful than we are. We have cultivated a relationship daily. We are assured in this. And so this faith that we have, we are justified in, and that allows us to dispense with any internal anxieties that we might have. And that's a mark of true faith, is that we can be in a storm. You know, there, there's that, you know, painting print in my thing of, you know, the disciples on the boat and the storm is rocking it and Jesus is sleeping. He's just at peace. And they wake him up and, oh, you don't have enough faith. You know, it's a, peace be still. And then it is calm. And so what we're, we hope for and what that faith should be driving into us or working into us or growing in us is that peace, is that stillness of heart that it doesn't matter what is going on, wind and waves outside, that inside we can have that. Do you think sometimes, I know this is true of me, that I worry too much about relationships with other people or what interactions I had that day or I worry so much about that, which is it's important, but it, it, as time goes on, that goes away. That maybe we should be more concentrating on our relationship with God right. than what our relationship with the humans Exactly, because what happens is, is if I focus when I was either writing my sermon or giving a pastor's direction, you know, in the th a couple hours for the meeting downstairs, if I was focused on what everyone wanted to hear, I would be a mess. But if I'm focused on what would glorify God, what would God want to hear? What does God, where does God... What does God want me to say? How will it glorify him? Is this good in his eyes? Then I, can, I don't have to worry about this. Right. I can have faith that this is the only thing that matters. And in doing that, he'll do this. Mm -hmm. I don't have to. The spirit will work on people. I do not have to mm -hmm. worry about, oh, well, so-and-so wants to hear this. And so-and-so wants to hear that. And I'm going to write. Everybody gets a, moment, a piece of the sermon. Oh, that would be exhausting. No, but you focus on the relationship with God, as you said. Now, does that not mean that sometimes I'm like this? Of course, I'm human. Like, I worry about what my wife thinks sometimes or, you know, what so-and-so is going to say. And then, but I have to return. That's like an external thing. I have to return to that faith. I have to return to that, so that peace, that calm, that Christ delivers and so I don't think you're alone in that because I, so I've certainly experienced myself and I'm pretty sure everybody else in this room has experienced that in one form or another. Yeah, exactly. And that's where personal desire or sort of uh, pride or uh, ego gets in the way because, or if it's not that, maybe it's a, a something where, um, see this will, Christians will sometimes often fall into the trap of niceness like they just want to be nice, and that's different from kind. That's different from loving. Nice doesn't make any waves, doesn't rock the boat, doesn't say anything that would hurt anybody else's feelings or their perceived understanding of that. That's nice, and we don't want to do that. We're not instructed to be nice. We're instructed to be kind. We're instructed to follow the Lord. And sometimes, and all that means is speaking the truth. 
That doesn't mean you're doing it out of anger. It means you're, you're telling the truth out of love and you try to do as much as you can in that. And but the only- It doesn't always perceive well. <laughs> no, that doesn't matter. but that doesn't matter because yeah. you're not worried about the perception down okay. here. You're not worried about the perception of the many. You're worried about what does God think? Mm -hmm. Is this what God wants me to do? But I mean, it's just a fact. You're gonna run into it. Oh yes. No, but that doesn't mean that you can't um, cultivate and grow in that. Like right. that fruit can grow because, you know, um, gosh. It's a little extra. Oh, yeah. And because I remember distinct points in my life, some um, before uh, I came, but then our, the Lord found me. But uh, then, and some after, like just immediately after, because I was like, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I have to make sure all these people don't think I'm some crazy you know, sinner, you know, I have to live up to this standard. I have to go. So because I was focused so much on the other person or the other people. And I was, what I found out very rapidly is that I was neglecting the most important person or three, three persons that I should be focused on, which is the Trinity, which is God. And, um, and what does he think? What does he want me to do? And as soon as I was led to that and I had prayed over it, uh, well, a, a ton of anxiety just dropped. His yoke is very easy. <laughs> um, and so, yes, great, great questions, great comments. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, in Kids Zone, we have some guidelines that you should live by, whether you're in Kids Zone or at school or at home. And one of them is to be like Jesus. And so we talk about that you need to, we do motions, because of course it, it's better with kids in motion. So we have to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. But only when we do that can we love our neighbor as ourselves mm -hmm. because so to your point we have to start here because otherwise we're not going to be able to do this well that brings glory back up to him right so the vertical relationship has to come first yes absolutely. yes because what can we provide that god cannot like what our relationship should be here because like because what we're looking at for here is like we want to provide to these people either love and affection or anything like that. We want to be provider there. But the, the source of all provision comes from God. And so that's where we need to sort of abandon uh, this idea that, or I shouldn't say the idea, we shouldn't put the, the one, the commandment that's like it ahead of the greatest commandment, which is to focus on God. Because he'll take care of the provision of everyone else in your, uh, in your circle, in your life. And I have full faith in that. I know I've said this story before about how Quinn asked me, it's like, well, who do you love the most? And I said, God. Because mm -hmm. he'll take care of you when I am gone. He takes care of all the people that I'm not standing in front of. In fact, he takes care of me right now. Mm -hmm. He is the great provider. And so that's where all your love and all of your affection should be uh, pointed. And then it's such a blessing when then he can use you as a servant to bless and grace and show mercy and forgive your neighbors and your family and everyone around you. Amen. Blessing to be a blessing. Yes. <laughs> All right. So 2 Corinthians 4.13. Can someone read that one? Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Yes. And so... The spirit of faith, what might he be talking about there? Any ideas? Mm -hmm. And I would say more specifically, it's like not a subcategory, but the spirit of faith is, uh, Paul talks about a bit, um, Abraham's faith. The idea of having faith in the Old Testament before the law was even there, but putting your full faith in the Lord um, and knowing that that's the same spirit that existed in the Old Testament, the same thing that God used to guide and the, the prophets and the people are the, yes, the people who wrote the scriptures, the same people who guided, you know, David against Goliath, you know, uh, oh, I'm, now I'm blanking, oh, pardon me. But the, the same spirit that gave the faith to march around the walls of Jericho without attacking and just letting the Lord do it. It's, so it's the same spirit that was working then, was working in Christ, 
and is still working today. And that is where we can find great confidence because people have believed and spoke and God provided. That's faith and trust. To say something you're like, hey, we're going this way, guys. And I, and I believe it because it was in the word. God has already done this and he's still doing it. And so that's that true faith that can lead you through a dark time knowing that he's already done it in the word. He's already, he's already shown it not just in the word but in our own lives but just you know, two years ago or five years ago or ten years ago or many times or yesterday. And so if he was going to provide then, if he follows his word and is true then, we have no, inc- we have no reason, there's no scripture that points to that he would ever stop doing what he does. That reminds me of the scripture, the same spirit or power mm-hmm. that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us. Right, yes, exactly. Think about that in your moment of weakness. It's, mm-hmm. it's astounding, right? You know what it brings back into the strength that it brings back to you. Yes, and so that faith and that uh, strength, that resurrection power, that spirit that was in Christ is also in the believer. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Helper, mm-hmm. and we are so blessed to have that. I feel. Verse Verse. You, the next verse says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Yes. So that, that, yeah. Yeah. They can't put all of Corinthians in here. They have, oh, just got to pick one verse. <laughs> and what about Matthew, Mark, Luke? Yeah. Well, no, and that's, that's, that's the other thing, too, is every one of these questions, this is a, supposed to be designed to be a catechism, mm-hmm. which means that it's for kids. It's for you know, new believers, it's for old people that have been uh, in the faith for many years to review, but it's supposed to be edifying. These things can be found uh, in pretty much every chapter and verse in Scripture, but you can't list the Bible every time you are trying to citing a question or an answer. Um, but that is where your study comes in. That's where, like, this is the milk, go find the flesh. Go dump in and find out where else this is in play. And this could be in a devotional that you're going through. Maybe you're reading the Bible in a year. Maybe you're uh, in a study group or prayer group. Or maybe you're watching a pastor or a sermon or um, some sort of history thing online. Think about these questions and then listen for those verses that say, oh, that answers that verse too. That's there too. Because that'll help broaden your understanding beyond just what we do in this class. And so, or... Uh, with what the Heidelberg Catechism has, has put forward. All right. Philippians 1, 19 and then 29. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Right. That's a hard one, but we're actually, that's the, what the whole sermon is about today. So, <laughs> uh, and I did not plan that. God's just great like that, I suppose. Um, or not, I don't suppose. I know. <laughs> um, and I, so we know that the Spirit is upon us. We know that we will be delivered. But then also, that for the sake of Christ, that we will just we will glorify him in belief, but we will also suffer. And that comes into work and our journey and our path. It's just not, oh, I believe, and then whoop, right up to heaven. And then there's no, no more trial or tribulation. And we're going to get really deep into this one on the sermon, so I don't know if we... Uh, well, 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 does anybody have any questions on maybe why we have to suffer? No, everybody's a, for, his glory. for his glory. Okay. For our growth as well. Yes, so our growth so like and. That's when the biggest growth takes place usually. Yes, but then also the growth of others. Like you, you when Christ suffered and died, it was not so he could grow; it was so others could grow. Yes, so that's where. Yes, exactly. That's like right there. You know, they 
perfect tangible. She said the thief on the cross is that in his suffering, someone came to the Lord, like perfect example. But then also in his death and in his uh, burial, his resurrection and ascension, all that pathway, he did not have to do. That did not grow him. It was helping us. And so that too can be true of our suffering. Maybe we are being tested by the devil. Maybe we are going through sufferings because we have to grow. But it is also true and it is also possible, in fact, I believe that God can do all three at once, that it's also for the other people outside of you. That people are growing outside of you. This especially comes up in end of life because it's, you know, people are, they're wasting away, they're, 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 they're um, what's the better word? You know, they're, they're not as sharp as they were. They were, they're declining. Thank you. That's the word. They're declining. Thank you. Um, and is that to maybe grow them? Possibly. But everybody is going to decline. Everybody is going to end. And so that, that process could bring them closer to God. But also true, everyone around them who has to go through that process, who has to see that, who has to care for them, that's also for their growth and their understanding and the glorification of God. It's not, we have a very, a very heavy tendency, especially in this, I would say modern day, but I think it's always been, um, to be very self-centered about our faith, not understanding how God is working through us for other people, even in suffering. I just want to share an example of that. This is um, a little close to the bone, but when, uh, when Kevin was passing, um, the kids were all there, but also Meredith's boyfriend at that time, who is a professing Christian but lives like the devil. Um, and uh, so he had come up with her from Florida. And his comment after Kevin passed was, I have never seen anyone pass so peacefully. And so he's like, I know what it, mean, what it looks like now for someone who lives for God mm -hmm. passing on. And I think the other people he had seen <clears throat> die, that was not the case because he said he had never seen anything like that. And again, so there's the suffering, but even in his passing, he left a witness. Right. And that's where, mm. yes. And so that's where growth, that's where modeling, that's where our own faith can, and we have faith that God is going to use our struggles, not just to, not for, just for us, but for others. And uh, again, that's true faith. That's, that's what we're pointing to, is the idea that we might be walking through, well, we'll talk about this today, a fiery trial. But will God use that to edify you? Yes. Will he use that to glorify him? Yes. Will he use that to show other people? Yes. And will he use that to, I mean, uh, Trying, I'm trying to use other examples that won't show up in the sermon in 20 minutes. <laughs> um, but yes, I, get, I think you all get the picture. And, and when we are suffering, Lord, is that the hardest time to think about other people? To say, oh, I'm suffering. I'm in pain right now. I'm sad. I'm depressed. That is the hardest time for us to say, well, maybe this is for somebody else. Maybe this burden that I'm carrying isn't for me, but it's for somebody else. And that, that can be very challenging to do, but it's something we must always remember. Even when we're alone, that doesn't necessarily mean that we are doing this alone. One, that's faith in the Lord, but then also that our sufferings will just be uh, contained to us and not used for the glorification of God, not used to bring people to the Lord. Okay, Romans 1.16. Who would like to read that? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Right. And so, I don't think we have confidence. I don't know if I can put, let's see here. I think it's somewhere under no. I'm going to put in some down here confidence. But to not be ashamed of the good news. Not be ashamed of Christ. You're like, how could I be ashamed of Christ? 
it happens. Maybe it's uh, you're reticent to approach somebody. Maybe you see something, but you don't want to rebuke. Or maybe uh, you, you see, yeah, it's fear, it's anxiety, exactly. You, 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 all of a sudden you clam up or you, uh, you know, you're a little too anxious. And that's where uh, shame comes in. And shame because uh, that's, well, you're lacking faith in that moment, to be completely honest with you. Because, in, because the good news, the gospel, is God's work to bring people closer to him, to bring the lost sheep back, to, you know, to speak to the prodigal son, to, um, to convict people who have done wrongdoing, who are against God, who are rebellious against God. But if we are ashamed of that, we basically close off an avenue for God to work through us. We grieve the Holy Spirit. And it's because it's the salvation for everyone who believes. And that's, it's not just your family members. It's not just the guys at work. It's for everybody on the streets. It's for the homeless person. It's for, you know, the checkout uh, gal at the store. It's for, um, you know, the, your mailman. It's for everyone. And to have faith in the power, and I, I know I've said this before, have faith that God is using you and working through you. E even if you're the first screen to stand on the scale or if you're the last one, because I know it took a whole heap of sand <laughs> to get me to look in the right direction. <laughs> you going to say something? Well. You're going to make her say something. <laughs> Oh, yes. But it comes from, the first thing that came to my mind was I dealt with rejection. Yeah. As a child, terribly. Mm -hmm. And so. But who are they rejecting? That was a huge, they were rejecting me. No. If you give them the gospel, who are they rejecting? Oh, God. Yes. You're off, you're, you're off the hook, so to speak. Like, well, you're, if you go and you are spreading the gospel, if you're using the word of the Lord and they reject that, they aren't rejecting you. They're rejecting God. And so, but you, you perceive it yes. in the same way you grew up with. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is that is a real stumbling block, has mm -hmm. always been a very uh, stumbling block for me, mm -hmm. you, know, to get, you know, to get past that. That own personal rejection right. to understanding that you're doing the right thing. You're doing exactly what God wants you to do, no matter how they perceive you right. as a person. And that's so, that's our flesh nature. So, that's pride. That's pride being hurt. It's it's anxiety over maybe losing what you have, and whether that's a relationship or wealth or or uh, social perception. Exactly. And but that's a again that's a. That's uh, that's human see, that's human weakness. That's the fallen nature of man. <laughs> just, that's where I was going to go. I was just going to say, doesn't that uh, depict what we're dealing with now? Like we're supposed to be all inclusive. God's not all inclusive, right? Aren't we supposed to be loving to those who don't love us and to th those that are sitting outrightly and overtly against us? Well, we not not holy. You know, God has a. What I mean by that is like so. Um, particularly like what's happening with uh, the Christians and, and the behavior, and behavior towards Christians and towards Jews today. We are a separated people. And for those people who are outside of that separation, they don't have an understanding of how we know God. Mm -hmm. And so their concept of what we think, what they think is in the Bible, is often so skewed. skewed and so different that it's really hard for us to stand in the gap and have people understand what we're doing. They, they just can't perceive it. It's not something they, I mean, even, even if you were to go back to the Jewish nation, they don't understand how you could be a Jewish Christian. And the men, how can Jews believe that they can, you can be a Christian and not Jewish? Right. It's, there's so much, um, there's so much out there that it's so difficult for others to understand what we have that we cannot 
hold into us what their view of us is. We can only hold into what God says about That's right. us. Right. Because essentially, um, you're you're letting an, a, a rebellious spirit against God live inside of you. Like you're letting that person who rejected God live inside you in your fears and your anxieties. And you don't want to let that reside inside of you because then that will grow. And maybe that is a childhood memory or maybe that is a rejection of, you know, oh, well, I went and I invited somebody to church and I got shot down pretty hard. And, you know, now I'm, I, I'm worried that I, that will happen again. Well, you're letting that interaction with a, sure. with a rebellious person, a rebellious spirit live inside of you and grieve the Holy Spirit from doing its work. And for, again, if, if it's people who don't understand the Bible or they have a preconceived notion of what it is, a really great question is, why do you believe that? Who told you that? Mm-hmm. Just start pulling out their, I don't want to say argument, but their understanding. Yeah, well, because... It's really easy to say no. It's very two-dimensional. But as soon as you pull out that no and go, okay, what's, what's behind that no? Then you can start being like, oh, well, I see a bunch of scripture in here, and I see where it's twisted and it's bent. And then you can start talking to them about that. Tell me more about that. Right. I do that with family members all the time. It drives them nuts. <laughs> Not immediate, ex, uh, you know, yeah. extended. <laughs> it's like, why do, you, why do you think everyone goes up to heaven? Why, what, and then... Usually, it's very shallow. The understanding is super shallow. And that's when you can pour out the depth of faith, of the gospel, and go like, well, there's all this stuff that you can not only see in the Word, but you can see in your life, and I can give you a testimony about it in my life. And that usually, uh, well, it'll definitely put them on their heels. And they won't be living rent-free in your heart. (laughs) And so that goes into Romans ten seventeen. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And that's the, those uh, Romans 1, 16 and 10, 17, they go hand in hand. It's why we can't be ashamed of the gospel. It's because we, we close off our mouths from spreading uh, salvation, uh, from the Holy Spirit using us to speak the word. We... We rotate reading the word in here as practice, as to say, okay, we're going to read the word out loud because that, the word of God is what makes believers. <laughs> and while that is, seems very elementary, we must be reminded of that all the time. Which is why people need to come to church or be in an environment where they're hearing as well as reading. Right, and that's why, but sometimes we have to bring the church to them. We have to go out. (laughs) And that's why I think Christ sent out two by two. Because it's not just you and some other person. There's There's a church. There is where two or more are present in his name. Jesus is standing there. And so that means when you go to talk to somebody, when you're out in the world and you're with another believer, it's you, the believer, and Christ are all standing there against one. And I think that's very... Powerful. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't be like a prophet and standing in a mob of angry people and deliver God's word. I think that is, well, God calls for such occasions very specifically to specific people. However, on your daily basis, when you're going and praying with people, when you're doing things like that, it helps to have a brother or sister in Christ with you. You even sent the animals to that. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was more for procreation, but yes. Yeah, uh, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. I'll take it back. I take it back right now. Well, no, no. I, yes. So I, I, but I also want to say it was for the, the spreading of um, new life and the species, mm-hmm. which is you can take that yes. to yes. Yeah. apostleship, and it's the spreading of new life, new life. and the yes. body of Christ. Yes. So it does work. I'm sorry. Okay. Shame on me. <laughs> um, all right. And so that faith, the faith that we have, is built up. We've received it by hearing it. And whether that's, you know, somebody coming and preaching to us on a street corner, or if it was our dad or our mom, or, you know, if it was a grandma that took us to church, you know, if it was maybe our own voice, maybe when we were learning to read, we were reading out loud the scripture 
And then that is what planted that seed of faith. And it has been growing ever since. And so, you know, that faith comes from hearing. And I guess, and uh, not I guess. And that's why I think that images, uh, we, I like to use slides because I think it helps paint a picture. You know, it broadens or brings to remembrance things. But at the same time, though, nothing is more powerful than the word of God. Nothing is more powerful than the revelation that he has given us in, these, in this text. And if anybody says, oh, there's so many versions. No, 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 no. Like, which one's the true one? And all, no, 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 no. The, the, these are different languages. These are for different audiences. I would not hand this book to a only Spanish speaker. He would not, this would not edify him. This would do him no justice. I would hand him a Spanish Bible. <laughs> and the same thing goes with, you know, the, the message or the NLT or the NIV or the KJV or... The ESV, the NRSV, all of them. They're, they're made, they're drawn from the same writings, but they're trying to communicate to different people. And so when people ask you that or say that, or, well, there's so, who is, what's the right one? You got like 100, 150, it's all the same. It's all coming from the same place, and that's God. Which one do you need to hear him? Which one do you need so you can read it? Oh, definitely. Well, there's, you can be edified in many different ways. Like the message that was written by uh, Eugene Peterson, but it's very simple to read. And so like my daughter can pick that up and just burn through all the pages, no problem. But like, is that how you want to study and get nitty gritty and all the little pieces of the scripture? Like, do you want to, like, what was the closest literal thing that we're saying? Well, yeah, you can grow into that. That maybe is what you're called to grow into. Because the most important part is getting Christ in your heart. It is to make sure that the Holy Spirit is residing in you because then you don't need to read and study the law. You just become, you, you participate and fulfill the law without having to sit there and just be doctrinal and legalistic about the Old Testament scriptures. But you should be able to turn around and look at all the Old Testament scriptures and go, wow, how great is the Lord that without knowing every single verse in that Old Testament, he is leading me in his way. And that's true faith. It's the, it's the true faith to walk forward with Christ without having to turn around to see if you're actually doing it. But if ever you're given the blessing and the time to see where you have walked and seen God's faith in or your faith in him and his faith in you and that relationship, it's a blessing. It always brings me to tears. And so that's true faith is having that in your heart. And that comes from hearing the word. And it's, let's see here. And this is Hebrews 11, 1, 2. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. Just knowing that we have faith in the Lord to guide us because through his word, through hearing his word, we know that he has been faithful and true to those who have come before us. His covenant people, the prophets, the disciples, the saints, the apostles, the churches, family members. The evidence is everywhere. That's why I... Man, I watched some old apologetics videos where I was on the team, I was on Team Atheist uh, in a debate against the Christian, and I cringe because of how, wow, they just don't see it. Their vision is so two-dimensional. They don't even realize the word is active even in their lives, but they don't even see it. Their curiosity I'm sorry? Their curiosity. 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 Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And here's the thing. I mean, maybe, and I know this is the, the a fact is that it was many of the grains of sand piling up, as I was talking about before. But in watching the apologetics videos of atheists try to slam Christians, I was hearing the counter arguments, which means I was hearing what God had to say to the atheists. Kind of like Saul running around persecuting all the Christians. You better believe he heard the word until finally Jesus showed up and said, why are you, why are you doing this to me, Paul? Or Saul? <laughs> mm. 
Okay, let's try to keep going. Sorry. Didn't mean to tangent. Romans 117. Who's got that one? It's the last one on the bottom of 42. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. Amen. We, we just were talking about that. Does anybody have any questions on that one? All right, we're going to the back page. All right, so we've now moved, we've talked about in the last few verses about the faith of people in the past, in the Old Testament. Now in Ephesians, we're going to go forward. Can somebody read Ephesians 2, 7, 9? Wonderful. We got receive. We got outside your control. It's all in God's plan and doing. But he's going to show it through your faith. He's going to do this through you, through others. And so not only was his word, his promises true in the Old Testament, it's also true today. And it will, you will continue to show immeasurable riches into the future. And not just to the whole world, but also to your own faith journey, your own path. And that might look like suffering, but that might have not, or I'm sorry, that wouldn't have been suffering that you could have even tolerated without God in your life. And so even with trials and tribulations, God will continue to provide and show immeasurable riches and grace. And then again, and we should all be practicing this daily. It's, it's all a gift from God. Everything that is good flows through him. It is not your doing. It is not my doing. It's not that group over there's doing. It's the Lord's. All right. I'll read Romans 3, 24 through 25. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Now, this is important because of this relationship here. I want to get into when this was written, there was the split had happened. The, the reformers and the Protestants were going away. Sorry, the Protestants were going away from the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church was all about works was all about completing tasks to keep some cosmic ledger balanced. Like, oh, I've done this amount of stuff. Oh, you're going to have to do that much work, and that'll balance it out. Uh, if, you didn't get your, if you didn't clean the books by the time you passed away or if something wasn't forgiven, then you go to purgatory, which please find me purgatory in Scripture. <laughs> Point being is that if it's a, and there was a TV show, uh, what was it called? On, was it NBC or something? It's called The Good Place. And the whole concept oh. is it's, a, it's, a, it's the idea, it was a philosophical and a theological TV show. But their idea of the afterlife was a ledger. You do good things, you get more points. You do bad things, you get less points. People under a certain benchmark go down. People above a certain benchmark go up. And that is, uh, unfortunately, how a lot of people practice faith. You know, oh, I'm justified because I went and I, I did this good thing yesterday. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm justified because I donated the most amount of money in my church. Or I'm justified because um, I went on that one mission trip and we built a house. Like, those are all works. I'm not saying those aren't good things. I'm not saying that God can't use those things for good. What I'm saying is that has no bearing on your salvation, on your faith, on what is God, how to glorify God and what he is doing through you. No, exactly. And that's where this comes in here, is that are we focused on what other per people perceive as good or what a good person should do or what the, bo the checklist is of good works that needs to be completed? No, you should 
be focused here. Oh, there we go. You should be focused on this relationship. Because I guarantee you with all your heart and soul, mind, body, everything you pour into this, these will be checked. God will use you to know those without even you. Because you don't know what that list is. You don't know your path. You don't know where he wants you to go. It's impossible to know this. So to say that your checklist is the same as my checklist, the same as your checklist, is folly. No, it's faith in the Lord. It's his work on the cross that gives us justification at all that is, a, is the source of our faith. And we don't even have to worry about a checklist because I guarantee you God is using us to check innumerable, oh wait, what was the line? Immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us, but then towards others. So then, the, again, this vertical relationship is the individual's responsibility, discipleship, that relationship no, I didn't mean to cross it out. Oh, dope. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to underline it. It's of greatest importance. And then through that growth, through that relationship, is what God uses to bless. Oh, but the world says the exact opposite. Well, the world's a liar. <laughs> Yes. What God says, and you said, which I love, what God, what we do for God will reflect in what their expectations for them is. Right. Even though the other way around won't happen because you don't have faith and you don't trust in what the Lord's saying to do. Correct. And we know that, yes. We know that all good flows from him, all provision throws from him. And so how, how should we provide our own salvation? Oh, we're going to do works. It doesn't work. The works don't work. Now, but you, by having faith, by having trust in the Lord, you will do works, mm -hmm. yeah. but they won't be a checklist. It'll be something that God has for you. You know, yeah. You show me your works, I'll show you my, my faith by works, I believe is the, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where, and that's where our trust and true faith comes in, is not to sweat and have anxiety about the check boxes is not to see what other people think of us and what, uh, what they believe you know, uh, a Christian should be. But are you growing in this relationship here? Are you, are you diving into the word? Is, is, is Christ using you? Are you grieving the spirit or are you letting him guide you? And you're like, well, what does that look like? Can I get close to the word? You see exactly how God does it in people. You'll see exactly what prophets say in certain situations. You'll see exactly what disciples ask. You'll see exactly what Pharisee, what Christ's response is to people who don't believe or to Pharisees. And you'll see exactly how to spread the good news with Acts and the epistles and how to act with one another in God's word. It's all laid out. There's no better way. It doesn't matter what kind of sermon I give up there, how many cool pictures I show up there. I can give a you know, 10 hours straight of how I think the Bible works, it's still never going to be. It's still going to be insufficient comparatively to the Word of God. Amen. Well, which is why you stick to the Word of God. I try to, yes. best I can. <laughs> Anything that's not of the Word, that's me, and I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. And so, Galatians 2.16 So that we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Right. So guess what? There is a checklist. No one can live up to it. <laughs> because not only have we seen God's law in Old Testament, we've also seen how we cannot live up to it. There's, there's no way. And it's not because God does not want to be in a relationship with us. It's because of our own fallen nature. It's, it, that's, we did this to ourselves. We have to, have the Old Testament is about the Hebrew people sacrificing for things they didn't even know they did. Right. But the fear of. Correct. It's, that's when you think about your everyday life and you go to bed at night and you were to 
Uh-huh. You would be, if it wasn't for Jesus, you would be sitting here writhing in fear and shame. Yes. But because of Christ, we don't have to sit down and make that account like they did actually have to do in the old days. Yes, the cosmic ledger. But also, and, and to build on to that point and to what question 21 is talking about, is that everybody, even the people without the law before yep. in Genesis, the people with the law and the people, in the, all of their righteousness, their, their faithfulness, their faith in God was the thing that brought them through. Yep. Not yep. how many boxes they checked. Mm -hmm. And that's what this question is trying to really hammer home, is to make sure that we know that you can't just show up to a church, get a list of 10 things and say thank you, and then go, and then say your Hail Marys and, you know, do 10 hours of community service and donate so much amount of money. While those all things can be good and God can use them for good, they have nothing to do with your faith. It's faith in a checklist. It's faith in the guy that handed you the checklist. And it's not a true relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Lord. And so let's read, us, let's read the answer, and then we will be done. True faith is not only a sure knowledge, whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also a hearty trust, which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel, that not only to others, but to me also, forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation that are freely given by God, merely of grace and only for the sake of Christ's merits. Amen. Wow. And as, we, as we've gone through all those verses, that answer should be completely clear to you. But if it's not, does anybody have any questions on it? Or praise God. All right. Thank you all. Sorry if I ran over a little bit, prayer team. I have no clue because my watch is bad.